Okay, hello and welcome to this tutorial. We're going to talk about how the spanning tree protocol works. We first started talking about spanning tree briefly in the ICND1 material and there we covered what spanning tree does. And that is to prevent layer 2 loops in a switch network. So we took an example of the broadcast storm where a broadcast frame gets on the switch network and it keeps getting forwarded between all the switches and it never arrives at a final destination. Eventually, it causes a lot of problems. This broadcast storm is a never-ending loop of frames over and over on the network. And this type of behavior can bring a network to its knees. It can severely impact production traffic. So now we're going to continue the conversation and talk about how spanning tree works, how it goes about preventing loops like this from happening. My recommendation is to watch all of the spanning tree videos uh, one after another as we've lined them up in the video index. There's a lot of information here, so we've broken it down into smaller segments so it's easier to grasp each one. Okay, but ultimately do what works best for you. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, here's our sample network. And the first thing we should know about spanning tree is that it enables these switches to know about each other, to be aware of each other. And these switches accomplish that by communicating, and they send messages to each other. These messages are called BPDUs, or Bridge Protocol Data Units. Inside each BPDU is some very specific spanning tree information, and that's how they become aware of each other and share information and ultimately prevent any loops from happening. So it's a very important aspect of spanning tree, and we get into some of the details of what's inside that BPDU in a different tutorial. But for now, just be aware that these switches know about each other, and they communicate with each other using BPDUs. So now that they are talking, and they're friends, and they're sharing spanning tree information, the first thing they want to do is to elect a leader of the network. And this leader is going to be a reference point for the other switches to align themselves to. Think of it in terms of planets and solar systems. One switch is going to be elected to be the sun, and the other switches will be planets, and they all use that sun as a common focal point or point of reference. Well, whichever switch is elected to be that, that leader is going to be called the root bridge. The other switches, switch B and C, are going to be what is called non-root bridges or non-root switches. And by the way, the, the term switch and bridge is, is used interchangeably when you talk about spanning tree. It comes from the fact of the history of bridging and switching in networking technologies. So if you're not familiar with that, take a look at the ICND1 materials on the history of bridging and switching. Um, we're not trying to confuse you here any more than uh, naturally happens to all of us when talking about spanning tree. Okay, so a bridge is a switch. So now that we have our leader, which is switch A, the root bridge, the other non-root switches have a single task to perform. And that task is to determine the best path to get to the root bridge. Now, switch B and C have two ways to do that. Each one of them have two links, and either one can get them to, to the root bridge. Well, how do they decide? I mean, which one is better than the other? The answer comes down to a cost, and each one of these links is going to be assigned a particular cost. And just like when we go out shopping, we want the lowest cost possible. Well, it's the same thing on here. Spanning tree likes a lower cost. These costs come from the bandwidth of each of these links. So if we take a look at this key here and fill in some samples on our network, you can see that a 10 gigabit link is going to have a cost of 2, whereas a slightly slower link, a 1 gigabit link, is going to have a slightly higher cost of 4 and an even slower link of 100 megabits per second is going to have an even higher cost of 19. So I've put in a few of these sample costs on the network to see how we can figure out how these switches will determine their best path to the root bridge based on the cost. So if we start with switch B, on this link it has a cost of 2, and if it goes out this other link to switch C, it has a cost of not only 4, but also four between switch A and C. So it would add them up to be a total cost of eight. You can see that the cost is cumulative to connect switch B to switch A. So here it's pretty simple to figure out. Switch B would choose this link as its best path to the root bridge. Likewise, if we look at switch C, 
it has a cost of 4 on its directly connected link to the root and a cost of 6, 4 plus 2, if it were to go via switch B. So here again, the, the choice is pretty obvious. Switch C will choose this port to get to the root bridge. Now these ports have a very special name. They're referred to as the root port, and each switch on our network has only one root port. And as you can see, quite simply, the root port is the port which identifies the best path to the root bridge. Now the root port will be forwarding, it will be actively forwarding frames on the network. It's an active link. So now the second task, after a switch determines its root port to the bridge, to the root bridge, and, it, and that means it's determined its best path to get to the root bridge, it needs to figure out what the other ports on the switch are going to be doing. So switch B and switch C are connected. And so that's a shared network between them. Who's going to be in charge of that particular network segment? That's what each switch is going to ask themselves. And switch B and switch C will figure out which one of them is going to be in charge of sending and receiving frames for that one particular segment. Both of them can't do it because that would open up a potential loop in the network. So only one can be in charge of that particular segment between them. They do this by comparing the cost each one has to get to the root bridge. So switch B would say, okay, my, my root bridge cost is two. What is yours? And switch C would say, well, the path to the root bridge for me has a cost of four. Well, so when, since switch B has a lower cost, it would go ahead and become what is called the designated port for this particular LAN segment. And the designated port is in charge of forwarding frames to and from this particular segment. Now switch C, since it is not the designa designated port, and again, there's only one designated port on each LAN segment, it would go ahead and put its port into a blocking state. And the blocking state means that no frames are going to be going in or out of that particular port. There's a little bit of detail we should add there. Switch C can receive BPDUs from switch B on that link. In other words, it can still receive spanning tree information from switch B, but it's not going to send anything out that port, including uh, BPDU. So it's effectively shutting it down. Okay, so each switch here is going to have a root port and here possibly a designated port, and then all, of, all the other ports will be put into a blocking state. Now if we look at the root bridge itself, since the root bridge cannot get any closer to itself than it already is, each one of its ports are going to be designated ports for these particular LAN segments with switches B and C. So this is a designated port and this is a designated port. Down here, this is the root port and this is the root port for switch C. And then finally here we have the designated port for this particular LAN segment and this port is in a blocking state. And so Spanning Tree has accomplished its goal here. Each switch now has a single path to the root bridge and the loop is broken because switch C has put one of its ports into a blocking state. So now this circle that we formed here uh, between these three switches has been blocked at switch C so that we don't actually have a loop on the network. However, this link is still available to us should there be another failure on the network and it needs to be put into action. Now we're going to see how Spanning Tree uh, reacts to different changes on the network in a different tutorial. But this is, this is overall, this is basically how Spanning Tree goes about preventing loops on the network. Okay, to summarize what we covered, we now know that Spanning Tree uses BPDUs in order to communicate information between different switches. The first thing Spanning Tree will do is to elect a root bridge. And then all of the non-root bridges will find their root port. And that root port identifies the best path in the network to get to the root bridge.
After that, each switch will see if it's connected to a shared network segment. And if it is, it will determine, with the other switches connected to that shared network segment, a designated port. And that's simply the switch that has the best path to the root. That particular switch will become the designated port for that shared network segment. And the designated port is responsible for sending and receiving frames, and the only one to be allowed to do that for that particular segment. Designated ports and root ports are forwarding ports, meaning they actively transmit production traffic. All other ports, in other words, ports that are not root ports and ports that are not designated ports, are put into a blocking state. And blocked ports do not forward any production traffic. So a blocked port is what's responsible for breaking up the loops in a network. Keep in mind, BPDUs can still be received on blocked ports so that the switch can still communicate with its neighbor. And ultimately, Spanning Tree achieves its goal of creating a single path from each non-root switch back to the root switch. Okay, and so that's it. That is how Spanning Tree works. After this tutorial, you should go ahead and take a look at the next one, which gets a little bit into more detail on how the root bridge is elected in a Spanning Tree network. Okay, thanks for watching.